Good evening, everyone. How are you? I was thinking we'd have a really intimate little setting, but yay, lots of people interested in elections and running for office. That's something that I really appreciate. I'm Pam Anderson. I'm the principal for Concilium Colorado, and I've been working with Erie over the last few years on elections matters. Um, we have a team here tonight to sort of orient you to the um, election process and being a candidate. Um, and also orient you to your contacts for the town of Erie, for um, your interest in running for office, or how to become a candidate, and so on and so forth. So the first thing we're going to do is some more introductions, and I'll tell you a little bit more about myself. But Margie, do you want to I'm Margie Greer. Um, I'm the interim city clerk for the town of Erie. It's only temporary part-time until they fill the position, so um, I'm here to help with the election. And I'm Joanne Salzer. I'm the deputy town clerk, um, kind of doing everything right at the moment since our town clerk has left us. But uh, if you have any questions or any c concerns, whatever, please give me a call. I'll be glad to help you out. Great. Again, I'm Pam Anderson. Um, so I worked with Margie uh, in Jefferson County. I was the county clerk in Jefferson County uh, for, for two terms. So I've been a municipal clerk and a county clerk. Um, I ran for office three times, so I can sort of share my perspective on that side, um, as well as, uh, Margie, you're in really great hands because uh, she's an extremely experienced municipal clerk. Um, we are going to start um, with an overview of what is this job a little bit. In your packet, it goes into a few items of the demands of the job. Um, and we'll talk about the qualifications. We're also going to walk you through how you get nominated as a, as a candidate and the petition process and what are some of the do's and don'ts and give you some tips for a successful petition circulation. Um, campaign finance, everybody's favorite topic. It is clear as mud. Um, so if you start reading this stuff and you say, oh my gosh, it's, you're, you're, you're okay. It's perfectly natural. It is um, not the simplest, most straightforward process in the world, but hopefully tonight we'll be able to clear some things up, give you some, um, some of the high points, and uh, talk a little bit about the election, and then we'll open it up for questions. We'll also pause at different um, points, and we're very happy to answer any questions you have tonight on any topic related to elections, running for office, becoming a candidate, or some of the requirements for that. You do have a fair amount of reading material if you're going to be a candidate. We're giving you some homework. In the packet, you have a candidate um, orientation packet. And in there, there are going to be links to more information. So one of the things that if you decide to circulate a petition and become a candidate, there's a link to the campaign and political finance manual that the Secretary of State puts out. T the town of Erie is a statutory town, so we fall under a lot of the rules, although the municipal clerk is the Office of Campaign Finance. So when you sign your candidate affidavit, you're saying, I've read this. So that's your homework, to take that, go, take, take that home. Um, tomorrow it'll get posted on the website and there will be links directly to that so you can download it. You don't have to print it if you don't want to, you know, if you want to save a tree because it's pretty substantial. But it also has the laws that you need to be somewhat familiar with and understand so that if there's a violation that you're responsible for, you know where it's coming from. Um, so that's, that's your homework um, to take home. And um, the first thing we're going to talk about tonight is qualifications for candidacy. So um, the first five bullets here are the qualifications under state law that every person that wants to be a candidate for any office need, falls under. One, you must be a registered voter by the time you have your peti petitions in. So if you're not registered to vote, um, that's one of the requirements that you need to be a registered elector in the jurisdiction. In the jurisdiction, so here in Erie. If you register to vote like me in Jefferson County, I can't run for Erie office. You must be 18 years of age by the date of the election. You must be a resident here, primary resident, for at least 12 consecutive months preceding the election. So the election's in April. So if you just moved in, you have to be here at least 12 years um, and a resident. Months. months. I'm 12 months, sorry. <laughs> 12 years, that would be a long time. Um, and then once you're elected, you must remain a resident for the term of your office. Um, you can't run for more than one thing, and you can't be elected to more than one thing. Um, and there's special requirements here in the town of Erie. 
One, if you can't be a candidate if you're an employee of the town. Um, you can't hold another office, including federal, state, or municipal, and that's more specific than the state statute. And you currently can't be in litigation with the town of Erie. So that's the town code, okay? Those are the basic requirements. Any questions about that? What about relatives being employed, town employees? Relatives is not a, a restriction, as long as there's no lawsuits happening. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, being a town trustee, um, who is an incumbent? Who's been here, done that? They're, you know, I run for office as well. Who's, this is their first experience running for office. Raise your hand and you're interested in running for office. Great, we have a good mix for that. So being a town trustee, what are you know, sort of the responsibilities of the job? And we have a few incumbents here that can you know, certainly weigh in on the demands of the job, but one of the th more uh, important things to remember is what the role of the Board of Trustees. One, they act as a body. You're running, you're a candidate, you're an individual, but the actions are, is of the entire board. And um, here in Erie, we operate under policy governance, right? So you're not here operating the town day to day. And if elected, you'll go through some orientation and some training that will do a little bit deeper dive on this. And so you're not here managing the staff. You have a, what's called a council manager form of government. So the town manager operates and runs the day-to-day -day operations. And the uh, board sets the policy and the guidelines um, and the laws for the, for the town of Erie. In your packet, there's some information on the number of meetings and attending meetings is required. You got it kind of show up um, to you know, make your policies made, um, have your policies made. There are packets that you get that are sometimes substantial, correct? There's a lot of reading material in it, and some of it is fairly technical and detailed. And so um, it's gonna feel a little bit like drinking from a fire hose uh, you know, initially and learning all of the more technical and professional aspects. And the staff is here to help support that transition and orientation and is available for questions. But it is a fair, it's a fair investment of time um, to make sure that you're um, engaged in the decision making. Um, public service, the opportunities for public service and the challenges. Um, and I'm speaking, I'm putting my elected official hat on here a little bit. Um, my experience, I can say I've served, um, I was elected three times, um, two different offices, and one was uh, municipal and one was countywide. And I had a wonderful positive experience being an elected official. And when I say that, it's not like every day was hearts and flowers and butterflies. <laughs> That's not what it, what it was. What I felt like is um, I was part of my community. That was a really positive thing. I felt like I could contribute as a member of my community um, and give back. I learned a lot. Um, there's a civic, um, I, I have a value of civic service and so it really spoke to that piece for me. Um, and that was really a positive thing for me. Um, some of the challenges. Um, you are no longer a private citizen when you run for office or when you hold office. And employees of the town have that element to some degree as well. You operate in the public sphere. Everything you do is the bit for the business of the town is public. Emails, text messages, um, you know, your, your people will look at your social media. When you campaign, it can be, depending on your experience, a challenging experience. Um, if you're a very private person. I was a very private person. I had small kids, and so it was a bit of an adjustment for me. Once I was in office, one of the things that you have to think about is you are not going to make everyone happy. Half the people are gonna disagree with everything you do <laughs> at any given moment. And so um, that, you know, building consensus and community, that's one of the opportunities for the office, but it's also a real challenge when you know that there's decisions that you have to, be ma have to make that maybe don't reflect 100% of your constituency. Um, and so that's a challenge. That can be something that, you know, if you don't have a bit of a thick skin or you feel comfortable in that sort of environment, and for those that serve, um, I, I've served both at the municipal and the county level, and I have to say the, the closer to the people you are, the more challenging it can be on that front because your neighbors are calling about, you calling you about doing something about the weeds for this person or trash or, you know, you're really dealing with very close issues to your community. And so it, um, 
it feels really close to home. It feels really impactful, both on the positive side, as well as on sort of some of those challenges and adapting to some of them. Um, and, you know, things you say and do, you know, pretty simple rule, expect it, you know, expect everything you do to be on the front page, and when it's not, it's awesome. <laughs> but, but it's a very transparent public process we have in Colorado for our elected officials. Any questions or contribution or comments about that? Any dis disagreements for incumbents that feel about <laughs> right? Yeah, there's certain commonalities in any office you, you, you serve in. Okay. Nomination petitions. So if you decide to become a candidate and want to um, be nominated, um, the process for that here in Erie is to circulate nomination petitions. And here's a sample. You cannot pick these up now. You can pick them up starting tomorrow. So you can come to the town clerk's office and there's a sign-in sheet and they will distribute them to you. So what they essentially look like is this, and you guys can come up and look at this if you want, but there's 15 lines and you get signatures from residents of Erie and there's certain um, key elements that I want to um, recommend to you around circulating a petition. Um, first, the dates. Starting tomorrow, you can pick up your petitions and circulate them. It has 15 spaces. If you want more than one, pick up more than one. That's perfectly fine. You're only required to have 10 eligible signatures for your petition, but we recommend getting more because it's not uncommon to either have a mistake when someone signs their, their petition or they put an address they're not registered at, and it has to be extremely precise. So um, we recommend getting more. Um, this one sheet has 15, but certainly you can pick up more than one. Um, you want your uh, next step to also be filling out a candidate affidavit. We'll talk a little bit more about that under campaign finance, but when you circulate your petition, there's, there's a few things that um, we wanna put in mind. You can circulate your own petition, right? You can take it around to your neighbors, your friends, your family that are eligible in Erie. To be eligible, they have to be 18, they have to be a registered elector, they have to live within the city. And um, the address that they sign their petition on must match their voter registration address. So if they're, they're not registered to vote, that signature isn't, isn't going to be qualified. You, um, once you submit your signatures, the clerk will be evaluating it. Um, you can have someone else circulate your petitions as well. You can give one to a neighbor or a friend or your campaign manager or anybody who's in, your spouse or anybody who's interested in supporting you and circulating a petition. But that petition, a single petition needs to be circulated by a single person. So you can't say, I'll do half and you do the other half. Even if they don't completely fill out 15, that's fine. They only get four signatures, that's fine. But only one person can circulate. They sign an affidavit saying, I circulated this petition. There's an acceptance of the nomination. That's the signature of the candidate. And it must be notarized. So you know, stop at the bank, get, have that person get it notarized once it's complete or they've done as much as they're going to do or you are doing as much as you're going to do for your, for your petition. Um, we recommend not bringing it here for notarization. It puts the town staff in a little bit of a weird place regarding their notary. So stop at the bank or, or a notary that you use for other legal um, elements. So it, it just, it would put them in a weird place. So um, we recommend getting that notarized before bringing it in. Any questions about that? Yes, sir. Who gets it notarized? The person doing the circulating? The person doing the circulating. Great, good question. Both. Margie's telling me both. Sorry, the circulator and the and candidate. The candidate. Oh, because you have the acceptance Except, on here. Yeah. That's right, the acceptance is on here. So go together. <laughs> Thanks, Can I Margie. interrupt real quick and just make sure, did anybody not get a packet everybody's taken care of? Thank you. So I covered some of this, but you know, get more than, get more than 10. We recommend doing that. Um, Make sure, you know, when you're asking someone if they would sign your petition, are you registered to vote here in Erie, use that where address that they're registered in. You can assist someone completing it if they have trouble writing. You want it to be legible, but they must sign. 
because there's a signature on that. So you can assist, but please document they've been assisted on, on, the, on the petition. Um, you can turn, you know, the deadline to turn in petitions, um, let me go backwards here, is in your packet. It's kind of exciting mouse. Um, so the last day to file is January 27th. You can turn them in early. If you get it done in a day, you can turn them in. If um, after verification, the town clerk contacts you and says, hey, your petitions are insufficient, you do have an opportunity to cure and collect more signatures. The deadline to cure is February 3rd to amend your nomination petition, pull some more petitions, and get that cured, OK? So there's an opportunity to correct that. If you decide you circulate petitions and for whatever reason you say, yeah, you know what, I don't think I'm going this time. I'm, I've decided not to run. There is a withdrawal deadline. So you can withdraw your petition by fe February 4th. And then that will pull you out of the process for this go around. Okay. okay, so I'm gonna move on from petitions. Any other questions around that? Okay. Yes, sir. Can you explain how uh, people signing the petition can only sign for, say, three us? Mm -hmm. um, and how do you know what working is? Yeah, so you can ask, if, have you signed any other petition? <laughs> So um, there's a requirement in the candidate packet and under the state statute that you can only sign as many petitions as are eligible for office. So in it, there's three offices for a trustee up, one mayor seat. So you can't sign more. And it's all at large. So that's the reason, too. Um, so you can't have an individual can't sign more than three. If you want to ask them, have you signed any other petitions and how many, that's certainly a question you can ask the person that's signing. Um, the validation, the verification process will be checking to see and looking for those duplicates on multiple petitions. And so if they were to sign four, that would eliminate all but one, all but three, <laughs> the first three. So they'll count the first three and that last petition signature will be invalidated. It's dated. dated and there's an affidavit of notarization. So those would be the two pieces that you would look at. That's the only evidence you have. Um, it's infrequent, Margie, in my experience, we don't really see a lot of duplicates like that. So, okay, good question. All right, campaign finance, contributions. Um, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Types of committees. So there's multiple types of committees. I've only outlined the most common committees that you'll see in a race like this. But again, when you when you go home and do your homework, you'll read in the Secretary of State um, campaign finance manual um, other types of candidate committee or other types of committees. The ones that apply most for candidacy. Is anyone here here for anything besides a candidate committee? Okay. So there's other types of committee. I'm just gonna go over them briefly. Um, standalone committees. So this is a committee for a candidate that says, I am not going to be accepting any contributions. So I'm only gonna spend money and it's gonna be my own money. And so that's what a standalone committee is. And there's particular paperwork for that. We'll look at that a little bit. A candidate committee, which is the most common that I expect for you guys to have, um, is a candidate themselves running for office and they're representing the, um, the campaign finance requirements for that individual candidate. Other committees that you may see active um, in Erie during an election, one, a political committee. So political committees can be, um, or an issue committee um, could be, I, we are pro X um, on a particular issue that's going on the ballot. Um, it's my understanding that there may not be any ballot questions, so this is only going to be a uh, candidate election, but uh, political co committees can, you know, to support the election of people that have red hair, right, can be a political committee. Um, and so that would be a different type of committee. And that's where more two or more people get together and decide they're gonna spend money on something in the political sphere. sphere. So not a single person. Single person, it's freedom of speech. 
right? But when two or more people are coordinating, that becomes a political committee. Another committee that we've seen activity with in elections and here in Erie in 2018 is what's called an independent expenditure committee. So these are committees of a group that, um, or two or more individuals that spend $1,000 or more. It is not co coordinated in any way with any candidate, but they are supporting a candidate. There can be no coordination with the candidate, so don't pick up the phone and call the independent or form an independent expenditure committee as, as a candidate, because that's not legal. You can't coordinate with a third party on that. But you will see um, groups, interest groups, political activists that form what's called an independent expenditure committee. They fall under other types of campaign reporting requirements and different forms and reports that they have to file, and you will see that come up. As a former uh, candidate and elected official, um, my editorial comment on that is it's come somewhat uncomfortable as a candidate to have someone talking for or against you that you have no idea where they come from, what they're doing. You know, I, I remember my first race, this was years ago, there, a box ad showed up in a newspaper supporting me. I had no idea who they were. And it's, sort of, it's a sort of interesting dynamic that, that happens in a, in a campaign. Um, and, and the alternate can happen as well. They'll be advocating for your opponent or against your candidacy. This is the legal requirement for their reporting, and that they're, they, they are subject to state law and local filing requirements for that. And there's more information in the campaign finance manual. But the key thing for you guys, for candidates, do not coordinate with them. That's illegal. So if someone picks up, hey, I want to form an independent expenditure. I'm sorry, I can't talk to you about that. Okay. So how do you know when you're a candidate? What are the things that trigger your candidacy? There are two things, and they're and things. One, you publicly announce an intent to run for office and you receive a contribution or make an expenditure in support of a candidate. So both those things trigger what you need to do to come in, fill out a candidate affidavit, and start the campaign finance process. However, the recommendation from the Secretary of State and from your town clerk's office is set it up before the second one. Go ahead and get started on that. It's just sort of the safer bet. If you're posting on Facebook, I'm, you know, there's, there's not really an exploratory committee provision for a local office, so just come in and fill out the paperwork and submit it. It's, it'll keep you in a better position, both politically but legally as well. So our recommendation is fill out the candidate affidavit and then, you know, start thinking about forming your committee and um, filing the campaign finance initial paperwork. Any questions about that? And examples of that are in your packet, but we'll look through them just a little bit. Question on the affidavit because yes, it, uh, uh, this is a nonpartisan race, but it says in the affidavit it mentions political parties, so you just leave that blank. Or Correct. For municipal that. office, it's nonpartisan, so you don't have to declare your affiliation. It is publicly available information, however, sure. under your voter registration, but yeah, it's not required for the form. Margie or Joanne, you have anything? Okay. <clears throat> Question? <laughs> <laughs> All right, just checking my notes to make sure I've covered everything. So contributions, does anybody, um, so I, I sometimes get this question, I like to hit it um, head on. Um, a candidate says, I'm not accepting any kind of contribution, not going to do any of that. And there is a provision for that. You have to file expenditure reports assuming you're spending, but I've also had candidates um, say, I'm not going to accept contributions and I'm not spending a dime, <laughs> right? And there's, there's two thoughts to that. I have heard candidates say, I'm not accepting contributions of this type, right, PAC contributions or something of that nature, um, and that's, that's absolutely right. But, um, you know, editorial comment, these offices, um, they're what's politically known as sort of low information offices, like folks don't 
get to see your name or know who you are or your background. If you don't spend anything on your campaign, people don't know who you are and what the candidate is, and it's going to appear on the ballot. And I guarantee you the town clerk's office is going to get a few phone calls about that. So, so you know, think about that. You know, it's, it's, you know, you can determine how much you need to raise or how much you want to spend. But, you know, having some sort of expenditure to tell voters who you are um, is not, is a good uh, civic engagement process too. And so um, while it may, it may not be uh, something that you're going to take contributions for, you may be self-funded. Remember, reporting your, con uh, your expenditures is also required. A little bit about contributions. Any questions about that or concerns? Okay. So no one's like, I'm not spending a dime. Okay. Because even if you use a couple of envelopes off your desk, you just spent money. For your, for your candidacy, and you have to report it. So you might have something free at your house. It's an in-kind donation to, or a stamp. It's an in-kind donation to your campaign. So it's very difficult not to spend anything. Um, contributions. So anything, any contributions less than uh, $20 must be reported, but not itemized. So in the report, we, we'll, we'll take a look at that. So you might. Um, the most common example of this is you have a coffee or something, or you have a, a, a you know, a little uh, fundraiser, and you have a donation bowl, and people put a little cash in the donation, and they're all under twenty dollars. A, that's really hard to track. Making sure somebody's not giving you more than nineteen dollars and ninety nine cents. They put a twenty dollar bill in there. That needs to be itemized. You need to know who that comes from. But sometimes you'll get someone say, Here, here's $5 for your campaign. That does not need to be itemized to an individual. So you can add those together and report those as under $20 non-itemized contributions. Everything else, $20 or above, has to be itemized. And you also have to aggregate it for the entire reporting period. So, um, we're going to see the reporting timeline for campaign finance. You may have someone give you $100 in January, and they give you another $100 in February, and they give you another $100 right after the election. You have to aggregate and report that individual has now given me $300. Um, so I recommend a spreadsheet for your own purposes. The reports are handwritten. They're not automated. So you have to transfer that. I'm sorry, there's no. Um, automatic thing at the local level, but uh, but keeping track of that aggregation is is important. This includes, as I said, monetary or non-monetary. So if you have um, a business owner that um, is a printer and he's willing to donate flyers um, or door hangers um, for your campaign to you, and he says, "I'm going to print these up for you," you have to report that as an in-kind donation. Um, I received $300 worth of flyers for my campaign from, the, from this individual. Um, that's an in-kind donation. Cash, monetary donations are also reported. Um, any contribution more than $100, you must get the occupation and employer of the contributor. So if you have envelopes, you know, you want to make sure that they have that on there, occupation and employer. A best practice, I don't, I just take it from, get that information from everyone, and then you're putting in the report for the ones that are $100 or more, because um, it's the easiest thing to miss. When you file your report, if it's missing, that's a violation. So make sure you pay attention to that. And if you receive something and you're unsure, let's say someone dropped a check in there, it wasn't in an envelope, that's not uncommon. Call them, find the information before you deposit the money. Um, you have to um, you have to get that or return it. That information for hundred dollars or more. Your contribution is a contribution on the date of deposit, but you can't hold checks past a reporting period. So I'm going to save this big chunky check till after the last reporting period after the election day. Can't do that. So any any deposit any checks you receive. Um, at least five days before the, uh, the end of the reporting period, you have to deposit and report for that period. Okay, And then when you're filling out the report, um, completeness is important. Fill out as many of those, those things that you can. If you can't, you have to go back and ask your contributor that information. 
um, and try and get it as complete as possible, or you have to return it. Any questions about the report or completeness, or I'm struggling with this information, or do I need to submit this, you can call or contact the town clerk's office, and they can, they can help you with that. Any questions about the contributions? Yes, sir. I understood the example about flyers being an in-kind donation, mm -hmm. but um, what if somebody donates their time just building a website for you? That is an in-kind contribution. So there's a value to that. So you would need to place a value on that. So a person that goes out and hangs those door hangers, um, their time. So volunteer out. circulators is not, right. is not. But building a, a concrete substantial something is an in-kind contribution. So let's say you have a postcard and someone designs it for you, right? Yeah. Because they're, you know, even a hobbyist, you know, designer. You need to report that as an in-kind contribution with, for that concrete thing. So if you have questions about specifically what is and what isn't, you know, you can contact the town clerk's office. But err on the side of reporting everything as to the best of your ability is my best advice. Yeah, the whole, the whole process is around transparency for what, what you're expending to get elected. So, good question. So there are prohibited contributions under state law. One, corporations, profits, or nonprofits, you may not accept a contribution from any corporation or any nonprofit. They're prohibited contributions. Foreign citizens, corporate foreign corporations, or foreign governments, that's been in the news a little bit lately, um, that has been prohibited for ages. And so um, if you were, if you have a family member, that is not a citizen, that's not a legal contribution. So that's the most common example. Um, anonymous contributions, again, only those non-itemized, less than $20, $5 here, anything $20 or above um, are, not, uh, are prohibited. You need to know where it came from and you need to document it and report it. And here's the more complicated one. So limited liability companies, LLCs, um, are allowable under certain circumstances. The circumstances with which they're not allowable are here. One, it's an LLC that's a corporation. So I have an LLC for my consulting company, but it's me. It's a sole proprietorship. I'm not a corporation LLC. So I could make a contribution from my LLC. Um, but there are LLCs that are corporations um, and, uh, or labor organization, and those are prohibited under state law. Again, the natural person who's not a US citizen, so natural person is individual, um, foreign government, um, anyone, any stakeholder or capital holder in an LLC that has um, any foreign government connections are prohibited LLC contributions. And if they're treated as a corporation under the IRS code, they should be able to answer this. Um, you, you can't accept it. So you're thinking, how do I know? If you receive a check that say has LLC on it, on the website, there will be a form. There is additional reporting requirements for any LLC corporation. So they will have to complete a form. And within that form, <coughs> excuse me, it requires them to report all of the capital individuals who have a capital interest in the LLC, what proportion of their, the company they own, and, and so that you can allocate the contribution proportionally and split it up among the st um, stockholders. It's a so pain. So it's a little complicated. <laughs> um, I sort of said, I don't think I'm going to take LLC checks is where I went. Um, with that, but you might have somebody like myself who has a sole proprietorship and that's how they contribute. You just need to have them fill out the additional paperwork to accept it. <coughs> Margie, are you good? Mm hmm. Okay. So we talked about the filing reporting deadlines. Um, these are the deadlines. They're also in your packet. Um, there will be m reminders once you are an official candidate going out from the town clerk's office. Hey, if 
filing deadline coming up, but it's your responsibility to file your campaign finance reports on time. Um, here are some of the deadlines, the candidate affidavit. Tomorrow, if you pick up a petition, you can complete a candidate affidavit. You've got, you can, you could turn that in tomorrow. Um, if you don't turn it in tomorrow, you have 10 days to get that in after you pick up your petitions and begin circulating. So it's a nice thing to sort of get taken care of as soon as possible. It goes to I'm a candidate, you know, requirements. It just makes it nice and clear. You've got your paperwork filed up. Your first report is going to be due on March 17th. I want to point out that there is a $50 per day fine for late. So, and that is non-negotiable. The clerk has zero latitude or waivers or there's no process to say, sorry, I, you know, okay, I get it. You missed your plane. Um, there's no latitude. They by law have to assess it. So um, you're gonna wanna be on time for that. And the next one is April 3rd, which is right before election day. And then there's a third and final um, uh, campaign finance report due for the, not for the period, but for the election, right after election day. And, um, and then if you are done done, you can file a zero report. And so if you have money, if you have money left over, um, there are ways that you can um, zero that out. You're gonna wanna get a bank account for your campaign and so have your bank account for your campaign. Um, if you have money left over on, in the campaign finance ma manual, it tells you how you can spend that. You, um, pizza party is a really popular option, because <laughs> campaign pizza party. Usually there's not a lot of mo money left over, but um, you can also donate it to a nonprofit association, um, but there's more information in the packet for you there. Campaign finance reports are public. I'm gonna say that again. Campaign finance reports are public. They're gonna get posted on the website so that anybody who's interested in knowing who's running for office and how it's going um, and what they're reporting and where they're taking money and how they're spending their money is readily available. So all of that will be posted on the website. Any questions about that? Okay. Is that new for the town of Erie? They've always been public. They are posting them on the website to um, become more efficient instead of having core reports, which co are very costly to do. I'm just gonna put those right up, right out there on the webpage, which is the common practice, which is the, the more common practice. Okay, any questions about campaign finance? I know you have some reading to do and all that. Again, if you take it home and come across something that you're not sure of, yeah. You need to create a bank account if you're doing a standalone campaign? No. Thanks. Yep. You're just reporting your expenditures. You're not taking any contributions. Good question. Did you hear that? You don't need to form, get a bank account for a committee if you're not forming a committee. Does that make sense? So you're just, if you're forming a candidate committee, but a standalone is just you, not a, a larger committee. So. Um, the other thing on the candidate committee, you'll notice there's a registered agent portion. You can serve as your own registered agent and be the filing agent for that. Um, or you can have someone else be your, your registered agent and responsible for your filings and be the, that contact person for the town clerk's office. Okay, we're just gonna talk a little bit, a few things about the municipal election. Um, you'll notice you have a calendar. It's a bit of an abbreviated calendar for the, for the uh, candidates, but there's a calendar in your packet um, with some key dates. Um, this will be a mail ballot election, so uh, those of you that are less familiar with the types of elections, um, a mail ballot will be sent to all eligible electors um, uh, starting the week of March 16th. So there's this, you know, not every ballot drops on the same day necessarily, but um, the week, 22 days before ballots start going out to every eligible elector, who is that? Every registered voter who has not had an undeliverable correspondence or hasn't moved since they most recently updated their registration. Um, there will be a lot drawing for candidates on February 6th. 
So lot drawing for February 6. That process is we have the race for the, the mayor's race, and then we have three trustees race. They run at large, and so it's the top three vote getters that then fill those seats. So the lot drawing will be held on that evening, and um, the names will be drawn for the ballot order for the candidates. So there's two candidates for mayor or three candidates for mayor. That's a random drawing for the ballot order. So that's how that's determined. It's not alphabetical or anything like or who gets their candidate affidavit in first. It's, um, it's a random drawing. The lot drawing is public. So you'll get, as a candidate, you'll get an invitation to come watch it. I think we're going to videotape it this year and record it. So if you can't make it to the lot drawing, you'll be able to see it online on the website. Um, there will be a few ballots going out um, on February 21st to our overseas and military voters. Um, there's only, I think, in 2018, Amy, I think we had like 12 military. We had over 100. Never mind. We had 12. <laughs> it was a smaller, I know who it was, and it's not you guys, another client. Um, and so uh, we don't, uh, in, in elections years like this year, um, the return, if there's no ballot question, is you know just OK for military overseas. But I can tell you, Erie had a record turnout for their last municipal election. Um, it was uh, 50, 48, 49 something percent, which I think was the highest they'd seen in quite some time. So, um, so expecting another high t turnout with the mail ballot election. Again, no ballot question, and just a candidate election. Election day will be April 7th. So voter registration for um, Colorado voters. You need to be a resident of anywhere in the state of Colorado for at least 22 days before election day. But you can register up and through close of polls on election day, 7 p.m. So you can register and, and receive a ballot. Um, the town clerk's office will be uh, will have an opportunity for people to come in to register um, to get their ballot to replace their ballot um, or deal with any any instance that they need to deal with with um, with the election. Um, polls will close at seven. You'll see um, initial results usually hitting. Um, shortly thereafter, no later than 7.30 is usually the target time for that. Um, and then ballots will continue to be processed through the evening um, with a final posting of unofficial results later in the evening. Um, results are unofficial on election night because one, you may have a close race that may trigger, trigger a recount. Um, I can answer any questions about that if you need, but um, two, there needs to be uh, um, a certification of the results. So there's a formal process to certify official results. Um, so those are the two things that can happen. Um, and then I, I believe the swearing in date for, in, um, for the new incumbents is in uh, the last meeting in April the 28th. So that is the election. Um, one question that we often get is campaign signs. Um, the rules in Erie are no campaign signs in the right of way. If they're placed there, the staff will remove them. And they're expensive. Just put them where you're going to find, oh my gosh, this campaign sign super expensive, crazy expensive. Just put them where they're legal. And then you won't have them removed and wonder where they went. Um, and tell, tell your campaign workers that. It's helpful. Any questions about that? Yeah, there's a process. There, one, one of two ways will, will happen on election day. One, there's a registration judge that gets um, that we have here on site from the counties. So you have Weld County and Boulder County um, here in, in Erie. Or the other process is the voter can go to the county and update their registration and gets what's called a certificate of registration. Or we can do it electronically. So in other words, you complete your form. The town clerk is a, re a registration agent. They submit it to the county. They process it and send it back and say, here's your certificate of registration. So it's a really, technology is a beautiful thing. So that registration gets varied. So their address, so there's address libraries that ver verify it's an eligible address in the address library for the voter registration system at the counties. So that's one way. And they're swearing an affidavit that they are resident at that address for at least 22 days. And it's legal aff affidavit under penalty of perjury. OK, good. 
Good question. Um, the packet, I know you've had a chance to look at some of the forms on there. Not all those forms will apply to you as a candidate. So you'll see samples of independent expenditure committee forms in there. That's not for you. Remember, we're not coordinating, but um, in the event that we had someone here interested in that topic, that was included in the packet. You have hard copies that you can, co you can use and complete to turn in for your first report. But again, all of it's going to be posted on the webpage, the campaign finance webpage for the town, including an electronic um, link to the campaign finance manual for your homework. Um, and um, there's a fair amount of detail in those reports. In the packet for the candidates, You'll see contributions and expenditure report. You'll see non-monetary contribution report. That's for those things that are in-kind um, that you're talking about. Um, it's a fairly straightforward summarize, um, you know, total it up and then put it on the cover page. Um, you'll have your signatures for your registered agent, whether that's you or someone else. But if you have any questions when you're completing those, please feel free to contact the town clerk's office. Um, my best advice is as you're getting things in, if you're doing it as you go, whether it's with the spreadsheet, it makes it so much easier than 48 hours before the deadline and you're trying to pull it all together, which I've been there. So um, does anybody have any questions about the packet or anything they came across? You're all excited to run for office now, right? You're I all think, in? I think you've intimidated all of them now. Did I? <laughs> I know. It, it can't, it, it, the campaign finance sounds scary, but it's not. It, once, once you start doing it, you'll be like, okay, I can do this. Um, it's, well, it's, it's very worthwhile. I um, really appreciated my experience and, and my time. Um, and while some things are somewhat more uh, uncomfortable, it's worth it. It's worth it. So I encourage you to um, stay interested. And if we don't have any other questions, we can finish up. Yes, ma'am. Um, Given recent events and the high turnover in the town, how are you going to ensure an election, like the election integrity? Um, this is the second election that we haven't had a city town clerk. Mm -hmm. um, so how, I mean, I know you're here from out of town, right? Mm -hmm. So, so I was here for the last election. Um, so I was supporting the last election. Um, elections is my area of expertise. Margie Greer is the interim town clerk, has also conducted elections as well. Amy con you know, was very instrumental in conducting the last election. But I'm not, Amy, do you want to introduce yourself? She was making copies, so she didn't get a chance to introduce herself. My name is Amy Tietzel. I'm the administrative operations manager. So I'm not sure if those of you were here in 2018. It was it was a pretty um, it was a perky election. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and and so there there are a lot of moving pieces. And the elections are conducted by the residents of Erie. They're election judges. It's overseen by your chief election official, which is the town clerk. Um, but it's a very transparent process. There was a presentation in 2018. I'm absolutely sure, sure it's going to happen again. We have a presentation about what's your election like in Erie? What are the components of it? What are the checks and balances and transparent pieces? And the ballot chain of custody and the seals and the logs, all of which are public and available under Cora. And so I encourage you as a candidate to come to that so you understand how elections are run in Colorado and at the municipal level. Um, and that it's, I, I, I think it's fair to say that uh, Colorado has some of the best elections in the country. I do this around the country. Um, I was the president of the Colorado County Clerks Association when we implemented our model and have done about 20 elections years, I guess, in my career. And it just keeps getting, we learn and do better every single time. But I think it's a really transparent process with a lot of integrity. And so I encourage you to come back and attend that election um, program. If you have questions about the election in particular, I'm going to stay afterwards. And you can ask me all of the, I call them the meteoric, well, what if this were to happen? What's the resolution? Because what I know about elections is extremely human. There's a lot of technical. And what we do in elections is make sure we have a plan. And Erie has a really good plan, if I do say so myself. I help them develop it. So i um, happy to answer any questions about it. Real quick, the uh, last minute voter registration. Does the town keep a list of who those individuals are? 
Yes. And so. Available to the town, the residents. We can pull that to who registered. So all election records while the election is happening are, is available, all the publicly available. So there are certain confidential voters that are designated confidential in the voter registration file. That's the only exception. Um, but all of that is in, you know, ballot logs, anything that you want to see, you can put in a Quora for and see that. And remember, your election judges are also that sort of uh, check to that entire process. But voter registration records are public. You can get lists from the county clerk's office, as well as once the election is begins, there will be a list of voters that were sent a ballot and voters that have been received about, have, we've received a ballot back. So um, there are all, logs to all of that. It's really transparent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what if your core request is What if you ask for something and it's not given until after the voter, the election has been certified? So CORE is not the only way to, um, there is an element, a, a, a legal option. Um, one, you have watchers that are available for elections, so you can designate as a, can, as a candidate a watcher for the entire election process if you want. You can sit there for any election activity that takes place. The other thing is if you, your question specifically around voter registration, um, you can challenge the eligibility of an elector under Colorado state law. So you can challenge a voter. In my career, I've seen three challenges and none of them were el on the eligibility of the elector. It was on some other item. But that is a tool available to any registered elector in the state of Colorado. So if you get a list and you're not sure of their eligibility, that, that is one component. Does that make sense? Okay. Great. Any other questions? Okay, and I'm going to stay around, and Margie's going to stay around until you guys have any um, offline questions you want to ask. But we're also keeping a list for anybody that wasn't able to attend tonight. If there were questions that we get, I think keeping a running list of frequently asked questions is something we'll keep posting so that everybody has all the information as new information or new questions arise that we hadn't even thought about. So thanks for coming tonight, and hope you have a good evening.